gone now. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to one of the last sessions of TechChill 2019. My name is Sebastian. I'm the head of story program at The Next Web. And today I have the pleasure to uh, welcome to the stage uh, three kick-ass female um, panelists. Welcome to the stage, ladies. Um, Welcome, welcome. So I'm really happy that we get to do it a little bit differently. So most panels, you would end up having three white males over here and one female moderating it. So I'm really happy that you're here and we can change that and uh, actually show the audience here a little bit uh, the, the impact that you've been creating through, through, your, through your different organizations. So before we get into uh, the intro, I would love to uh, all of you to welcome uh, Laurence Maino, uh, who's working as a global lead for Shiva's Venture. Uh, we have got Sally Heave, who is the founder of Inspiring the Future, has been working on the Forbes Technology Council, as well as working on different UN-related uh, programs. And then we have Linda Vermat, who's been uh, involved in impact space in many different ways, which we will explain, but notably scouting for different organizations like the Postcode Lottery. Um, welcome. Thank you very much for being here today. I'm really looking forward to our discussion on the role of the different uh, stakeholders in the impact space, from government, corporates, to different social entrepreneurs and how they play together. Maybe um, I would love to hear from all of you a quick introduction about who you are, the organization that you work for, and what pushed you to actually spend a lot of your time and energy uh, working on creating an impact. Okay. Laurence, would you yeah, like to start? I'll start. So uh, I'm Laurence. Uh, I'm French, but I'm based in London, and I work in the global marketing team for Chivas Regal Scotch Whiskey. Um, and my role is to lead the Shivers Venture, which is a global competition for social entrepreneurs uh, across 20 countries. And we give away $1 million in grant funding and a three-day accelerator program in, in London. So we're looking for for-profit businesses that have a social or environmental uh, mission at the heart of what they do. And how I got involved, <laughs> uh, long story, but I'll try to keep it short. Uh, I suppose it started when I was at business school and I went to a conference by Danone Communities, the social impact fund by Danone, uh, the dairy company. And I heard Professor Mohammed Yunus uh, speak on stage uh, about the concept of social business and I was really inspired. Then I went to read his book called Building Social Business, which I'd recommend to anyone. And uh, Richard Branson's book, uh, Screw Business as Usual. So from that point, I, th I thought I have to go and do something, work with social entrepreneurs. But that's not the kind of jobs that's that easily advertised. So I came out of business school and thought I'll do two years um, or so doing marketing in a big uh, corporate. I started working with Panorica and well, little did I know that a couple of years later, a social impact fund would be created on the brand that I happened to be working on. So I suppose right place at the right time. Fantastic. Pleasure. Interesting shared journeys here. We had, a, yeah. we had a lovely chat before this started, and it's, it's lovely. I think you'll see that as this comes across in the conversation today. But uh, I'm Sally Eves, and my big passion really is bringing education and technology together to create social impact and really scale that. Um, so I'm a professor, and I specialize in advanced tech, so things like blockchain and AI. Um, I'm also CEO and founder of Aspirational Futures. And this, if anything in my life would be a legacy project, this is what I hope this to be. Um, and what we're doing at the moment is scaling hubs across the world, repurposing space, for example, in redundant city centres, and creating hubs which are really safe, that are open to all. There's not the barriers of money, for example, to get involved, and you can learn new skills, you can help transition, um, and it brings arts and technology together. So very much STEAM rather than STEM focused. Um, and also you can learn things in these really critical developing areas as well. Um, so yeah, I'm very much passionate about that and we're doing that across the globe in conjunction with the United Nations and bringing universities, academia, civil society and government work together, which I think is a big theme of what we're talking about today. No more silos, that's what I'm trying to stop. Um, and also I do a lot of advisory work around frontier technology as well. So again, particularly in blockchain and AI, how we can harness that. And, it do, and I also really strongly believe it doesn't have to be a case of either or. It's not good business or social impact. Yeah. We can do both. We yeah. can have a true social business model that's very, very authentic. So I'll stop talking now, but I'll pass on to Linda. Sorry, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, uh, for inviting us. Also, Textil, thank you so much for putting impact entrepreneurship on the main stage, because I think it just needs all the attention and everyone should be involved in one way or the other. Absolutely. 
Uh, so I am involved in the impact space and I actually do three kind of things. So one is I'm a startup scout, which means that I connect impact entrepreneurs to all kind of bigger companies, competitions or accelerator programs. And I wanted to do much more, so I thought, okay, what is something that really touches people? And I think that's media. So together with my husband, I started an international documentary series, which is called Fix the World and Make Money. So we followed six entrepreneurs from all over the world, Australia, Peru, India, and we followed them for 24 hours to really show like, how you can tackle societal issues with being an entrepreneur. Great. Well, thank you very much for, for this short introduction. And we'll get back to the media in a minute when we talk about ways in which we can help those social entrepreneurs to get their story out and be able to leverage the different outlets that are there. But before we get there, I would like to uh, start directly on the government side of things, because Sally, I believe you've just come back from the World Economic Forum in Davos, where there's been a lot of interesting conversations around the role that governments play and different regulatory bodies can play in creating an impact. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you've been doing over there and why that's so important. Yeah, so my focus there was again around frontier tech, as I like to talk, it, talk about it really, breaking down barriers, um, particularly this whole thing I was talking about just at the start there, we have too many gaps, and sometimes we have too much of a delay, for example, with the research and academia side and putting that into practice, and we don't have conversations that go beyond sectors, beyond disciplines, so that's what I'm, my involvement really with government is trying to break down those silos and bring different people together so we have these cross voices. Um, so I'm involved, for example, with UK parliamentary debates around policy development, Development. So I think if you can bring in that experience in research alongside practical application, you can see it from both sides. We need that diversity of perspective. So I'm very heavily involved in that. Um, and also alongside the WEF, but also alongside the United Nations, things around social bonds and social impact financing oh, yeah. related to the 17 SDGs. So I'm heavily involved in something that's going to be announced literally about two weeks' time from now that's looking about how we can look at financing startups and more than that, scale-ups, because again, that's one of where one of the big gaps are. And I think also there's a lack of financing available that's more got more of a risk-centric focus to it, a bit like the presentation we had this morning. Um, I think we need to do more around that. So again, I'm involved in initiatives to help make that happen. But for me, this diversity of perspective is key and not having conversations just around blockchain or just around AI or just around impact and all about, you know, we need to bring all the sectors together. It's critical and that's the only yeah. way to make change happen, in my opinion. I agree. Yeah. Fantastic. And so for you, Laurence, it's very interesting to see how a government can have an impact on, on a company like Shivas as well and where the regulator, like the regulations actually come into play to either help or hinder the relationship with a company. Can you tell us a bit more yeah. about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, the alcohol sector is highly regulated uh, by governments around the world. Um, so Chivas belongs to Panorica, which is a French multinational, um, and that has, um, it's the second biggest wines and spirits group in the world. It has brands like Havana Club and um, Absolute Vodka and Jameson Whiskey, which I believe many of you enjoyed last night. <laughs> um, and uh, yes, uh, the responsible drinking is something we take very seriously. Uh, and we, we strive as a group to be ahead of the policy, so we impose ourselves certain rules that are stricter than the laws, actually. Uh, we have a, an internal code of communications and marketing, so for example, uh, we don't feature anyone in our ads that is uh, under the age of 25, because we feel that if they're under that age, they might look like they're under the age of uh, legal drinking age. And for that same reason, the Shivers Venture only um, uh, recruits entrepreneurs over the age of 25. That doesn't mean that we don't think that younger entrepreneurs have amazing things to do. It's just that as an alcohol brand, we feel we have a responsibility not to associate our name and our image with someone who could be perceived as um, underage. Fantastic. And bringing on to that and, and, and the relationship with those corporates and the social entrepreneurs like themselves, it can be quite difficult to explain how certain big organizations like Shivas and groups that obviously make quite a lot of money, in this case of selling alcohol products, how they're related to social entrepreneurs. How does Shivas do that? Yeah, yeah I mean, I get a lot of cynicism. Um, and uh, generally, I mean, when I say that we've been doing that for five years and supported a hundred startups that have gone on to impact over a million lives across 40 countries, then people start listening. But uh, it's true that you, you get that. And yeah, I think, um, Corporates can get involved with impact in different ways. Obviously, in our business practices, we always strive to more sustainability and circularity in what we do. Uh, but also at the brand level, and this is where I come in, um, it, we have a voice in 
society. We have a voice, we influence consumers uh, with the advertising and the communications that we put out. So yes, as, as Shivas, we decided to champion the fact that business doesn't have to be just about making money, but business can be about making the world a better place and still making money. Um, so that's why we supported the Shivas, we supported with the Shivas venture, and we. In terms of driving impact, we do it in four ways. One is um, mentoring. We do uh, an accelerator program in London with pitch coaching and we get them to focus more on, on their impact measuring. Uh, we have PR and uh, you know, all the media exposure that we give them across the world. Um, we have the $1 million in grant funding, uh, which doesn't go to just one, but we try to split it with, in the way that's most relevant to the needs of the startups. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, the sort of the community building as well. Lo being an entrepreneur can be quite lonely sometimes, and so connecting those social entrepreneurs from around the world, suddenly they associate with, they feel like they're part of a movement and they can advise each other and like, Literally, the guys from three years ago are still active on the WhatsApp group and sharing tips to each other yeah, today. Wow. So building a community. I think that's quite important to mention that past what you would advertise every year online and the $1 million that you would give to the finalist, the added value goes way beyond that $1 million. Yeah. It's all the other activities that are involved. And I'd love to have your opinion on that, Linda, because obviously you've been scouting for Postcode Lottery Green Challenge and other organizations. Yeah. How do you see this with those, those yeah, founders? Especially the added value, because of course, if you're a startup, you're always in need of money. So uh, the winner of us gets 500,000 euros, that's, they get it in cash. So it's not a return on investment, it's really like free money. But most of the time the winners say, well, actually the money, of course it was good, but the stamp of approvement, that was actually really well. Because we are really looking for startups who most of the times investors are not willing yet to invest in. But we believe that you need to just support these businesses because otherwise, how can we ever change the society? We need to stop up and give them a boost. And this has to do with stamp of approval, uh, make sure that they get in the media, uh, but also we have a beautiful event where we invite all kinds of different players and let them connect. And that's where I think this is also so cool that Check Chill now also yeah, puts this on stage because that makes us think about it, that makes us talk about it, and hopefully makes us cooperate together. Makes sense. And what about you, Sally? You've also obviously been working with and advising a bunch of different organizations in the impact space. Like, how do you see this sort of startup uh, corporate relationship work and how are the corporates invested in really helping? Yeah, I think we've got an incredible opportunity here for CSR to finally be done right, <laughs> uh, to, to be honest. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm very much advocating how that can be done, how we can make a tangible difference here. So one example with Aspirational Futures is, it doesn't have to be about money either. I mean, that, that obviously can be very, very helpful. But as you were saying, the community build, the sharing of ideas, but also donation of equipment, donation of time, employees yeah. getting involved. There's a whole different ways that different employers can get involved. Um, so as an example, we're working with Dell at the moment. And I think that's a great example of, for example, there's a... a small startup from India and they've been looking at the problem of climate change and looking at carbon reduction, an issue from diesel generators and you can imagine in certain countries there's a huge, huge problem with pollution. It's affecting people's health on a day-to-day -day basis and they're partnering with them in terms of taking that soot from diesel exhaust, using that to create ink and paint and then putting it into their packaging. So you get that whole supply chain change of partnering with a smaller organisation and then with us in terms of developing the talent to help scale that and make that grow and have people got the transferable skills for life. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of different ways that I think employers can get involved and it can be true and authentic and create sustainable lasting change. Yeah, maybe nice to add. What I see much more is that now bigger companies also um, open their doors up actually mm. for startups to do pilots. And I yeah. think this is super valuable because if you want to grow your company, of course, one-time funding is nice, but if you have a pilot, then you can test your product and it means that you can make it better and better and better. Absolutely. So then hopefully you will get much more clients in the end. So I think this is a really interesting uh, involvement. And do you have particular examples that you're referring to when it comes to building those pilots as the Postcode Lottery been like, facilitating those, or is it no, through no, other organizations? No, no, because the Postcode Lottery is actually Green Challenge. Uh, the, it's, as the name says, we are a lottery. This means that in the Netherlands, if you want to start a lottery, you have to give away 50% of all the money that comes in. So this is just for us a way actually of spending that money. Um, so we are not that corporate, but I heard that, for example, Heineken, uh, they also did a challenge, and this challenge was about, okay, how can you actually get to logistics, but can get it in a more CO2 reductive manner? 
And I think these are really interesting things. You see it as a kind of like external R&D. So you said it really brilliant in beautiful like companies who are making the, the world a better future. How did you say it? What was the sentence again? It was so, so brilliant. I remember, yeah, but okay. yeah, interesting okay. the future. But I mean, I think to your, your point about the grant, the only thing I would say is that the beauty of having like grant funding is that we can take a bit more risk and yes. and, and uh, we have the liberty to really invest on impact. Yeah. So, for example, the winner of our competition um, last year, so in May 2018, was a, a company called Change Please Coffee, who train up the homeless to become coffee baristas, and he came to us. Well. He's got a brilliant business, brilliant brand. He's, he, the judges were saying, you know, you're ready to take equity funding. But he said, first of all, he wants to make sure he can still say 100% of his profits are going to help the homeless. But also he's saying, well, traditional investors might not be interested in funding his training academy for the homeless because that drives impact, but not directly profit is just a way to, uh, to make sure that he can work with the homeless uh, in his business. So we can take we, a bit more risk with that. I mean, going directly into change, please, I think he's a, he's a brilliant uh, example, Jamal, of how you sort of leverage uh, what you've been accomplishing with Chivas to be able to take that further and help their businesses grow. I know that they've been working since then with Virgin and putting their coffee into all the trains in the UK. They've been having support from the mayor of London, amongst other things, which I think is pretty exciting. But how did you then, getting into the media angle, also help those startups with Chivas to get the attention that we're actually talking about? Yeah, so we, we, do, we measure the impact of the competition every year. And one of the things that comes back from the entrepreneurs is that the PR and digital exposure is probably the biggest benefit of the competition um, because we have a global footprint and we work with PR agencies around the world and we engage media, we sell in the stories of the entrepreneurs um, to, to be told. And um, we had uh, last year about three th over 3,000 pieces of coverage with 1.4 billion reach. Um, so obviously for the entrepreneurs, they get access to publications that they wouldn't. And uh, in the specific example of Jamal, he said he had about 3,000 emails uh, after he won the competition with people who were interested in replicating his model around the world or wanting to start uh, having Change Please Coffee carts uh, around the world. And he's now expanding to the US. So, yeah, yeah really exciting. I mean, this is, this is interesting to bring... Uh to bring to people in the audience as well, because obviously Shivas has the budget or other organizations we've talked about to have a big cash price for those entrepreneurs, but often the side benefits from yeah. organizing that competition and everything that comes with it is just as valuable as the money itself, yeah. which means you don't need to have that million dollar to give away to actually create an impact by being able to sort of uh, give back through other ways. Yeah, it was actually also a really interesting spin-off was that uh, two years ago in Rwanda startup one, her company was called Earth Enable, and she already tried for a long time to contact the government, but she couldn't get in. And then she won our competition, and so we made a really brilliant press release, and also we said it to media in Rwanda. And all of a sudden, uh, the president called her and said, okay, can I please invite you uh, to come on over? And now they're working together. So I think this is so cool. It is. I, I really believe that um, social media and just PR more generally, it can change the narrative. Yeah. You know, obviously I work in areas like quite heavy blockchain and AI, AI, AI sort of side of things, and quite often there's a bit of a dark side that's carried in the press there, and yeah. blockchain's conflated with cryptocurrency, for example, but also the narrative is all about, you know, what tech can take away and robots stealing jobs and that kind of stuff. Tech can be a powerful, powerful enabler too. I mean, I use social a lot, and I'm very happy to connect, by the way, at Sally Eves, because I, I love, I love conversations but um, I think it can break down barriers. As you were saying there, you can reach people more quickly than you would not be able to reach beforehand. And you don't have to you know, invest a lot of money to, to create your own social media community. If people have got the same values of you, you can build up a really powerful, authentic audience there and get the right people together to make stuff happen. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a massive advocate. Let's change the narrative. So regarding the narrative, I was just really, really annoyed that always when we talk about climate change, it's always so negative. And I believe that if we just bring it in a much more positive way, we can accelerate people to actually join us and do something. Absolutely. So that's why, like three years ago, I never did anything with film. Luckily, my husband did. He went to film school. I just said to him, you know what? We're going to make a documentary series, but focus on solutions. Because the most brilliant documentaries, for example, Leonardo DiCaprio with Before the Flood, 
or an inconvenient proof of Al Gore already in the name, it's negative. And I think we should definitely, definitely change that angle and make stories that resonate. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree on that. We, we also do marketing materials for the finalists, so we shoot uh, videos every year and photography uh, to tell the stories. So we'll be revealing actually this year's finalists in a couple of weeks on our, on our website and um, completely agree on the videos. We've been really mindful to put the solution forward rather than just making people feel terrible about the problem. Empowerment. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I mean, on the back of the documentary, one of the things I'm interested in, we talk now about have government support, have corporates, have mentors support those social entrepreneurs, sort of almost thinking that they really need that help. But you've also found in different parts of the world, social entrepreneurs that started with very tiny grassroots organizations and build something. Like, do you have examples, something you would like to share around Yeah, this? what I think was a really interesting one is that the, the guy we found in India, um, he makes edible cutlery, and he was already trying to sell this idea for a long time. So he hates plastic, and all of a sudden he was like, hmm, maybe I can make it a uh, sign of a kind of a cookie. So I, afterwards, if you eat with it, you can just throw it away, or you can... Uh, eat it, actually the cookie, the cutlery itself as well. So that's why it's called edible cutlery. So he was struggling a lot of time with this. And then uh, there came a really big media partner in India. They made a short film of him. And all of a sudden he was skyrocketing. People noticed him, people were buying their products. So media can be such a strong yeah, tool. Absolutely, yeah. Couple questions from the audience that I'd like to, to cover quickly before we wrap up. The first one would be, what do you think is the biggest challenge in creating better collaboration between governments and entrepreneurs? Okay, well for me it's this cross-sector dialogue. We need to open up things where everybody can take part and not just have, for example, policy committee meetings that have only got people in a very nuanced area. We need to make things truly open and really use the power of open data. So definitely it's this whole thing around connection, cross-sector, cross-sectoral collaboration, different voices. And, get, and social media, I think, again, can be a powerful voice for people to get involved, crowdsourcing that opinion and really encouraging people to get involved and have the confidence to do so. So I want to, I want to create um, this contagion of opportunity around that. So yeah, opening access has got to be the way forward. Okay. Any other comments from you ladies on this? No? I'll just get on to the next question, which I think is quite interesting too. So how do we make startups... Uh, oh, that one disappeared. No, it's there. Yeah, yeah. Startups in the tech world care about social impact and not about becoming the next unsustainable unicorn. What's the business case for them? Yeah, I believe it's a, we live in one world. So if you, we pollute something here, everybody in the world actually also... Um, feels actually the consequences of that. So instead of saying we are, have two worlds, like we have the money world and we have the world of the do-gooders, please let us talk with one another so that because it is actually one. So the people in the business world, please let them talk about doing good and the people who are doing good, please also think about business models. And then I think we can really, then these questions are not necessary anymore because it is all one. Absolutely. I think we need to stop thinking of a juxtaposition. Exactly. It really is a hybridity. And I think across the world, people want to be working, whether it's, you know, it's a gig economy on their own or in groups or big online agents. It doesn't really matter. There's a real drive for purpose. Yeah. And purpose-driven business can be very, very powerful. It can make money, but it can do all of these other things alongside it. You know, all the research shows people leaving corporations because they're not happy. They don't feel exactly. there's a personal exactly. alignment with yeah. their business one. Everything is backing that out. So we just need to get that message out there. It doesn't have to be the either or. And also you see in research that much, much more custom, uh, customers, especially uh, millennials, they are looking for businesses mm -hmm. behind the products they are buying. So if you actually want to, in the future, want to have a business yourself as well, you have to switch. Exactly. And, we, and we don't have to always think that, that those types of initiatives are small. You can very much scale with tech. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it. I mean, if I think back at one of the startups we had a couple of years ago called We Farm, they enter the competition, they, they do an app that, does a, that connects farmers peer to peer um, to help them with uh, their agricultural challenges. And um, they, they started, they entered the competition, they had about 20,000 users. By the time they pitched in July, they had 60,000. Now they've gone past a million uh, users wow, uh, awesome. in, in just a couple of years. Super so up. it's great when tech can be used uh, for good and Absolutely. also growing as a business. Great. I mean, last thing before uh, we wrap up, I would just like to ask you in a couple of sentences really quickly, give to the audience here, what will be your number one tip that people can actually take away from this room leaving to start creating an impact? How can they get started? 
I would say start with what's in your hand. I mean, for so if there's any social entrepreneurs in the room, obviously, you know, love your problem more than your solution. Your solution can evolve, but make sure that the impact that you're trying to create is your North Star. But if you're not a social entrepreneur, then, you know, you can start driving impact where you are. You, you might be in a corporate, and you, it might be that if you shift the needle by 1% in your corporation, you're going to have more impact than creating a startup. So, um, yeah, and then in terms of, to your point, working better together, I think, you know, we have got to stop saying corporates are evil and charities are great, but they are not sustainability, sustainably, ah, you know, sustainable financially. Um, and social entrepreneurship is the, the, the key, I think. The, the key is everyone has a role to play. And uh, I mean, we, we, at Shivers, we say blended is better, not just mm. because we're blended Scotch, but you know. <laughs> That's good, yeah, I love it. <laughs> Sally, really quickly. Uh, yeah, no, I, I would definitely say um, um, passion and purpose are sometimes overused as words, but I wholeheartedly believe in them. So go with what you, what you believe in and what drives you. And there are ways to embed that in your business and in your... Per I think all these things can be brought together. It's this word hybridity again. So go with that. Don't be afraid to ask for help and make a connection, whether that's online or in person. I, I love that personally. And nine times out of ten, you actually get a very positive answer. So don't be afraid to do it. So definitely go for that. Um, and on a personal note with aspirational futures we're looking for ambassadors we're scaling that i want to create hubs literally in urban areas in rural ones because they're sometimes left behind as well um, and we're scaling that across the world at the moment aligned to social impact outcomes and we've got a lot of measurement around that as well so if you want to get involved in that please feel free to get in touch yep perfect and linda yeah, believe in yourself i really like this childhood figure she's called pipi longstock it's a little girl with like to the hair like this and she always said the famous phrase I, I never did it, so I'm sure I'm able to do it. And I just really love that. Just have confidence in yourself because you can reach so much more than you ever think. Okay, great. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you, everybody. And uh, enjoy the last talk. How are you?